sit here? All right. Uh. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be for the two of us to be here. Uh, I was supposed to be here a few years ago, but I uh, had to flake out the last minute and finally made it this year. Um, so we thought we would, we were just thinking about what we'd share uh, here, and we thought, mm -hmm. you know what, let's talk about like really practical stuff that we've learned. Uh, Sridhar and I have known each other for a, a little too long. A little too long. Yeah. Um, since the end of high school, actually, we're roommates in college, and we've started uh, and exited a number of companies together. We've done four companies yeah. so far. And uh, so we thought we'd share three general things. One is uh, just founder relationships. You know, what have we learned by being founders with each other across four companies, 20 plus years doing it? We've known each other for 10 years before that. And um, th that's the start. Second is we're going to uh, blitz through a list, a checklist of things to think about um, and our opinions of yep. each of these topics when you're, you're founding a company. And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about what we're excited about, the future. And so three things. Uh, so um, on the founder relationship side, right, um, three topics really, and you know, feel free to butt in whenever, right? Yep. Um, first is uh, setting the assumptions in place. You know, you're working assumptions when you start, a founder's code mm -hmm. uh, that you're going to agree to. Um, yeah, yeah, so one of the things that we did, because when we first got started, we lived in the same apartment uh, and worked out of the same apartment. And we were roommates in college, so we kind of understood you know, how to deal with each other. But we had to set ground rules, and that was key. We actually wrote it down in like a five-page document, and we signed it. And it was explicitly laid out things like uh, how, what our weekly budget was going to be for food. And it was uh, $20 during the week and $20 on the weekends. Taco and, Bell. And yeah, Taco Bell er, pretty much every night. But what, what, it, what it did was it enforced a certain level of discipline that we write down exactly what our expectations were. And, and that was pretty much what kept us sane. Yeah, and also, it, you know, it was like ground rules too, you know, stuff like quiet time so that we would leave each other alone because we're in such close quarters, how to not get sick of each other, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And so, and so one of the most important things that we did out of that, that came out of that relation, uh, those guidelines, were giving feedback to each other. And we had a very, very, a very structured way of giving feedback that we used to call uh, cluelessness sessions. The idea being that, well, if you're doing something stupid, it's not because you're a bad person, it's because you're clueless about it. Or you're just being stupid. Uh, so that, that happens so well. how to prevent stupid attacks for each other. And we figured, you know, uh, it's founded, the, the basis for it was uh, that we cared about each other, that we cared about, that the other person would do better. And so we, uh, over the years, we've used this cluelessness so feedback session type of thing uh, across all of our companies. And I think it's worked out pretty well. Pretty well, we've, well, we're still here. We're so still here uh, and yeah. still doing companies yeah. together. Uh, and so we actually, it's a fairly detailed process and a uh, kind of a doc document. If anyone's interested, you could email us. We could share with yeah. you the very detailed um, uh, way of, yeah. that we did it. But like one uh, thing that's kind of characteristic about the, this bilateral feedback thing is that um, when I give feedback to Sridhar, he can't respond. He has right. to wait actually until the next session, which is six weeks away, before he can respond. So it's, it's two yep. unidirectional feedback uh, yeah. cycles. The core tenet was you can't respond because you can't get defensive. The whole assumption here is that it doesn't matter if I screwed up, I need to hear it without, any, without being defensive. And that core tenet actually has kept us sane for the last 20 years. Yeah, so we've done that. We've done it with, uh, our, with the team members and employees and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, you shouldn't do it with your wife. Probably not yeah, a good idea. That, that, was, that was a yeah, bad idea. I think I might have tried that <laughs> once. And that yes, was you did. <laughs> not a good idea. Yeah. Um, so we have another one that we call the, uh, the, the buck stopping protocol, or BS protocol for short. Um, and really, that, all that means is um, division of labor and who has the final say in particular decisions. And when we did our first company, um, I was on the technology side and, and Sonny was on the, the business side. And we had a very clear division of what we owned. And at the end of the day, we could argue all we wanted to, but one of us had to, you know, the, the buck stopped with somebody on certain topics. So there you go. Three things to put into your founder's code when you're starting a company, right? A founder have, to have one. Um, feedback and transparency and a clear division of labor so that, uh, you know, uh, the buck stops with, someone, with one of the two or however many founders of you. 
um, when it comes to a certain domain. So that's, I don't know, we'll, we'll move on to, yeah. we're going to jump into a rapid fire list, of, a checklist of things to think about when you're uh, thinking of founding a company or as you're founding a company. Any, how many people, how many entrepreneurs in the audience here? I uh, love it. My kind of, Great. my kind yes. of people, my kind <laughs> of conference, right? So this is for you. And uh, maybe you've already thought about this, you know, but this is stuff that uh, came to our minds when we thought, what's going to be really useful to know or to think about when you're founding a company? All right, so I'm going to go. Right. Equity split. Who owns what of a company when you start a company? Okay, I am dead set against equal equity split. If you've got two founders, it should not be 50-50. Not 50-50. Not 50-50 if it's All two right, founders. there you go. Somebody has to take charge. It is one person's company more than the other, and that helps with the buck-stopping buck protocol. Buck-stopping protocol. It has yes. to bu stop, the buck has to stop with someone. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so two companies go when we did Agamatrix. Sridhar had owned more than me. It was yep. very, we were very insistent on that from the beginning. At Misfit, Misfit. I own more than Sridhar, and, uh, and then at Elemental, Sridhar's, you know, Sridhar's the man. Division of labor. So basically, I, again, it comes down to setting expectations right up front and writing it down and reviewing those responsibilities over and over and over again. When you work very, very closely with the co-founder, you're reviewing this on a daily basis. But as the organization grows, what we had to do is actually step back once a month, once a quarter, and say, are you, are you still doing this, or do you want me to do it? And that regular review meant that we could both grow as founders. I started off doing you know, lab work and, and science at the bench, and towards the end of, and, and no, like seven, eight years later, I was also involved in business negotiations. And you know, on the flip side, Sonny, you. And that was it pretty much. <laughs> I was pretty useless for anything other than business stuff, talking about what you did. Well, you raised money. That was very important. <laughs> Board structure. OK. So. Um, Again, for all the founders out there, grab as many founder seats as you can on the board because you will lose them over time. And that's, that's really served us really well in, uh, over the years is that you want the company to be built by the founders and guided by the founders. And the only way you can do that is to assure that the board dynamics are, are equitable in that, in that sense. Yeah, very important. Like when we did Misfit, it was we uh, were uh, three founders. Mm -hmm. Two of us plus John Scully, and three board seats. And we kept that throughout the whole cycle through seed, series A, series B, series C. It's very important. So totally agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. Personality dynamics. All right. Equal opportunity for all or autocracy, autocracy over democracy. All right. You heard it first. Yes. Yeah, a startup is not a democracy. So what does that mean? You're just going to be a tyrant through, uh, through all the companies? You have you to be a gentle tyrant and understand what's right for the company and not always lead by consensus. We talked about having a confederation of autocracies within a company. Yeah. And I'm definitely a fan of that. How about spending ethics? Like how to spend money? Yeah. Big um, topic. Definitely something to talk about before. It's like before getting married, what, yep. talk about your spending ethic. Yeah, it's almost like, it is very much like a marriage. You know, marriages fall apart because of financial disagreements all the time. So it's very hard to get divorced if you found a company together. Right. So, uh, you no, know, simple ethic is be cheap, don't spend money. Be cheap and don't spend money. Can you expand on that? Yes. But not to be penny wise and pound foolish, but the key is to be aligned on what you're going to be cheap about. So st strategic cheapness. Strategic cheapness. I would add shameless cheapness to it a bit more. Yes. And uh, one way to think about it, one thing I've told like, my entrepreneur friends is just think, if you are seed funded, every dollar that you spend now is worth probably $3, probably in just a year's time when you raise a Series A, assuming yeah. that's the milestone, you hit the milestones, right? And then maybe a year and a half, year, year and a half after that, it's probably worth another $2. So, Within two years, one dollar will have been worth six, seven dollars later. Mm -hmm. So if you're going out and having a really nice meal, hundred dollar meal, seven hundred dollar meal, two, two years from now. So keep that in mind in terms of time value of money and value of money now, uh, especially the earlier you, you are, right? It's, yeah. I guess it's an obvious point. Hiring philosophy. Okay. What do you think? Um, so first of all, uh, the, the way you build your company 
Uh, sorry, the, the way the company grows is entirely dependent on how you hire and what kind of people you bring on board. So how many people have heard the, the expression, you know, you have to hire the best people? Okay, hire the best. Hire, hire the, best, the best, hire, right? Hire the best. Okay. So I challenge that. And we actually do not hire the best people. Instead, so. we hire the best people we can afford. And there's a big difference between that because if when you're always trying to hire the best, you kind, of, you kind of take for granted what you're not hiring because you can get one amazing engineer and not afford anyone else. You can't afford QA, can't afford testing, can't afford support. So what you do, you have to balance it. But isn't an A player worth five B players? There's, there, there's definitely something to be said about getting good people, not necessarily the best. So really what I'm saying is... So you're, 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 promoting, you're, you're suggesting we should only hire B players? No. Well, I hired you, right? Well, well, um, grateful for the job. Yes. <laughs> no, um, it, it really comes down to hiring what's good enough and what's appropriate for the role. So many times I've seen people over hire because they had to get the best person for this. And it turns out there's a lot of grunt work in startup life. And sometimes the best person for that role isn't going to do won't, that grunt work. Won't put up with it. Won't put up with it. Yeah. And so hire appropriate. And, you know, there's always this other thing about, you know, you know what, what you make up in quality, you make up in quantity. It's a, Sometimes. Are you saying quantity over quality? I am saying quantity over quality. Wow. You heard it first here at Slush. <laughs> yes. Quantity over, over quality. quality. Yes. I think, let's take that in context. What do you mean by that exactly? Okay. What I, what I mean by that is oftentimes you just need grunt you know, manpower to get stuff done. And when you go out there and spend your capital on hiring the best tech talent out there, you're not going to have an army of people that can go out there and do the grunt work. And so many, many times... The way you succeed in startups isn't because you have a magic formula. It's because you crank the wheel a million times. And to do that, you need to spread your capital out. And not necessarily the best people for those roles are going to be the most effective. Let me insert a couple more things about hiring philosophy, something that we've agreed on over the years. One, do not hire in desperation. Every time we hire in desperation, we're like, oh, we got to have this person, um, that person, good enough, come here. Uh, that's not what we mean by good enough. That's good enough because you have to have it right now. Yep. Don't hire in desperation. It almost never works out. Um, and there's a few things that we learned over the years. You know, in our first company, uh, Firespout, you know, uh, machine learning uh, uh, language software, and we would try to hire really smart people. We realized it's not what you need. You need to hire people with great uh, skill. Uh, it's not just about IQ, it's about relevant skills. And we actually had a lot of like, ego problems in the company because we had all these smart people who you know, had to show that they were smart. Second company, we thought, okay, let's get some experienced people. Yep. You and know? You know, the experienced people actually brought a lot of knowledge uh, to the table. But when you, when you hire for uh, experience only, what ends up happening is they're not going to roll up their sleeves and they're, you know, they're not going to do the grunt work. And so there's a balance between you know, getting inexperienced but heavy lifters and experienced people who may not be heavy lifters. And you have to be careful about what 20 years experience means, you know? Yeah. 20 years of bad experience is still 20 years of bad experience. Yeah. That's like one year of experience 20 times. Not okay. the same thing. We're looking for... So what we found was that we're looking for wisdom, yep. not just experience. Third time around when we did Misfit, we realized cultural fit above all, you know? Um, because you can gain skills, you can gain uh, experience, but changing one's heart, changing... Uh, you know, whether people can look out for it after e each other or not. You know, it's not it's non-trivial. So uh, cultural fit was, mm -hmm. was, was really important. Okay. So let's move on uh, very briefly at this point. Yep. You know, let's talk about the future. What, what are you excited about? So what's funny what is do you that, do now? well, I mean, you, you look around this conference and you see the excitement over science-based companies. There's a lot of investment going into, into science. And, you know, five, ten years ago, that wasn't the case, where the, the, the predominant VC uh, sentiment was that we don't, we don't invest in science experiments. And yet now, VCs are absolutely investing in science experiments. So I'm excited about, about core scientific technologies coming out of the labs and going, getting into the marketplace. Tell them about Elemental, what you're doing now. So at Elemental, um, the, the core principle about what, what we're doing is actually we're building tools for scientists. We're building tools for people who do synthetic biology, material science. Um, and dr drug development, and uh, the, 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 the main tenet that's holding people back, in our opinion, is experimentation and the ability to reproduce your results over and over and over again 
in a way that proves a principle, de-risks the science, and most importantly, makes it manufacturable at a, a low enough price point that you can go into the market. And underpinning all of that is being able to collect enough data on your experiments and being able to sort through that information and present it in a useful way so you can build products on top of it. So at Elemental, we're building sensors and connected devices and machine learning algorithms on top of all these sensor streams so that scientists can actually accelerate their work. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's good stuff. Elemental machines. Yep. Um, I think the only thing I can get credit for for doing much of that is the naming. Seen, yeah, that was cool. You know, um, I did something, you know. Um, but then on the, on the flip side, what Sunny and I are both doing is um, investing and mentoring a lot of science-based companies. You've been involved in some really cool companies. Look, if there's one thing I learned from uh, previous companies, it's that if you want to build a 10x company, you either have to have 10x technology or science, something that's really like kind of gives you this unfair advantage, or you just have to work 10x harder. And you know, I'd like to just have that advantage. You know, I don't know if I want to work that hard. It, you know, it's, it's, it, was, it was a rough time, the first few startups. Worked very hard for a couple decades. Um, and so I'm excited about science, stuff that really makes this pho a phenomenal difference. So most of the stuff that we've been doing um, has been around material science, semiconductors, food biotech. So involved with uh, uh, a, a material science company called Matrix that does thermoelectric materials that's uh, going to revolutionize the refrigeration world. Really excited about that. Um, and uh, Perfect Day, you, heard, you guys heard from Ryan and Paramol yesterday, one of my favorite companies. Uh, and I had the privilege to uh, get involved early with them. And they're going to produce dairy uh, for the world without cows. I mean, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's gonna be uh, phenomenal. And so things like that will really, that have a universe denting possibility impact, that's what uh, I'm excited about these days. So what's next? What else? Uh, you know, what do you think about, we thought we just, we've just been, blown, first of all, we've been blown away by, uh, by Helsinki, by Finland. Yeah. You know, we came here kind of, you know, expecting cold and wet, which we're finally getting. We got, yeah. Um, but yeah. what, what do you think? Um, so this is, this, the Helsinki is, is, is awesome. And I was just thinking, like, I wouldn't mind having, like, a, a summer home here. Summer home in Helsinki. How cool yeah, is that? That would be cool. I'd, you I'd know, do that. I was thinking a winter bunker in northern Finland. How about that? <laughs> That's all right. We hear right, some we clapping here. That's yeah, what there we go. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. All right. Next startup idea: <laughs> winter bunkers in northern yes. Finland. So who's in Lapland? We're gonna <laughs> get a couple of acres of land and build a winter bunker, and that's gonna be new startup heaven. <laughs> there we go. Next for a uh, slush next year. Next year, yeah. Thank you so much. So, We're going to be taking some questions at the, the yep. I think, Founder Studio or something yep. like that. Um, so come over, you know, ask whatever you want, berate us, come, uh, disagree with all the stuff we said. We'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank you all very much for listening to us. Thanks.